Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another SciFest event online. We are so excited to have you all join us. Um, we are trying to get the live feed working as well. So hopefully, if uh, the technology behaves itself, you will all be able to participate and enjoy uh, from the comfort of your own home while watching it all online. Uh, what I do want to do is just chat a little bit about today's topic. And uh, as you know, South Africa has just celebrated Youth Month in the month of June. And this year, the South African National Space Agency, uh, otherwise affectionately known as SANSA, is highlighting the contribution by the space sector. And notice that there are many aspects to the space sector. There's the academic all the way to the industrial uh, development um, of our youth. And of course, it also involves organs of state as well. And the anatomy of the South African space sector panel will comprise of space professionals representing government, its agencies, academic institutions from basic to higher education, the private sector and the network of science centers that are coordinated by the South African Association of Science and Technology Centers otherwise known as SARS Tech. The South African Space Incorporated will also contribute to the South African and the African Space Program, as well as achieving targeted global sustainable development goals with a great focus on the future of youth in the space sector. That was quite a mouthful. What we're really trying to say is that we are going to find a way to bridge all of these sectors within the space industry, pull them all together so that you can see how they are working hard to develop the youth and the space industry together. Um, I do have Dan Matsapola all the way from Sansa who will be ably assisting me throughout today's panel because he does c connect with all of these sectors and I'm hoping that he will help to make all of this flow and ebb just beautifully. Um, I would like to welcome our panelists. We've got quite a few people here. Uh, when Sansa said they were going to submit a panel, they do not mess around. They asked for 13 people instead of the regular three or four panelists. So we are going to go a little bit over time, but hopefully if all goes well, um, we will make it and we will get through all the stuff that we want to chat about. I will certainly be asking a lot of interesting questions because as someone who is very passionate about the space industry and involved from an educational point of view, I do see it from various aspects because I've dealt with SANSA and the schools and the various private entities as well. So there's a lot that I would like to ask, but I'm going to start off by asking Dan, could you give us a, a, a small breakdown of who is who in the zoo and where they fit into the whole scheme of things for today's discussion. Are you unmuted? Let's have a look. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so everybody in the world in South Africa knows about space and the celebrated figures would be associated with the ones launching the satellites as we've seen uh, Elon Musk do recently. But there is an entire anatomy of players in the background you never get to know about. The uncelebrated defenders and middle fielders that never score the space goal. Okay, so we have government in its regulatory and policy making capacity. The real signatory of international treaties. And that will be represented by my two colleagues who are both chief directors at the Department of Trade and Industry, as well as the Department of Science and Innovation. And then government is an enabler and uh, policy maker, regulator. We then move to the agencies that act on behalf of government, the ones that produce the products from space, the ones that put together and take government investments in space and put up infrastructure 
that allows us to interface with the orbiting satellites to test, integrate, and assemble satellites. So you have SANSA, of course, I represent the science engagement part of SANSA. And then you have producers of products and services in the various divisions within SANSA and the greater space industry. And so we've brought them all together to come and share just where they play along the space value chain and what their unique value proposition is. And the space doesn't start without the most important value chain player. And that is the user of the products and services that actually are derived from space. Uh, we have colleagues that will speak to the space weather forecasting elements that support the aviation and other sectors. We will have earth observation users that use satellites in earth orbit to actually uh, inform better planning, monitoring, inventory of what is where on the surface to enable better service delivery. And of course, space cannot be without our academics, our educators, the ones who actually take the mathematics and the physical science and the geography and the computer sciences that go into creating a professional, a fully baked space professional with strong academic background so that they can impact the various research areas within the space value chain. And of course, then we will have uh, our partners in crime, those who communicate space, those who are aspiring space tourists. I see says Stuart and Clarty has also joined. Very good. So we've brought all these players to say, this is the value chain and the various segments that they represent. So I think government would be a good place to start to give us a good perspective of what investments have been made, what the big idea is behind space as a grand challenge, and uh, where the direction of our economy is going, and how space plays a role there. All right, well, if we're going to go to government, then um, we should be starting perhaps with, um, I, I believe it was the Department of Trade and Industry and the Department of Science and Innovation. So should we start with uh, Humbulani Madao? Is he there? He is. He is available. I believe he will give us a perspective on the Department of Science and Innovation, which is the shareholder of the Space Agency the owner of several policy instruments that are going to guide and actually guide the implementation by such agencies as SANSA and other DSI entities. And of course, they fund a lot of activities in the space value chain. And uh, they, they represent uh, a lot of interfaces with the global sector playing all the way to the United Nations committees that are related to space. But Mr. Modau is going to talk about that. And I have specifically asked him to actually bring the very important linkage. Uh, Steve, in your introduction, you said Youth Month was celebrated. The whole month of June is Youth Month. So Mr. Modau is going to bring that consciousness to the, to the panel and to the audience. I believe he's ready. He is ready. And we are live on Facebook as well. So it's perfect timing. Over to hi, you. And hi, everybody. And hi to all the audience. Um, my name is Umbranim Dao. I, I work for the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, it's a department where we do all exciting, all exciting stuff regarding research um, and development innovation um, and of course I'm responsible for the space science and technology um, chief directorate within the department and our focus is to ensure that we provide all the support that's required um, for us to have a conducive environment where uh, smart people, young, can come and be able to do um, the things that they do. 
So I, I just felt that um, Perez, Dan, and, and everybody, that I should first give you a context um, because this is important for us to, to have the context. Why is it so exciting for us to invest um, in, 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 in the space program? And I think this is very important for everybody, the audience to understand that, uh, you know, um, we're living in the 21st century, uh, which of course um, presents significant challenges to mankind. And therefore, what will be the role of space in ensuring that um, we do address these challenges and of course we do grow our economies and of course we do create platforms for our young people to be able to exercise their talents. But again, as I, I, I put this context, I want to say, what are those common challenges that we have? If we look at the, the whole of Africa, Africa being the second largest continent, what are those challenges that are common and which also pre present opportunities to us? Um, the issue of poverty, the issue of inequality, the issue of unemployment of our youth. As we know um, today, I mean, there's a huge percentage of young people that are not employed. How do we ensure that there's inequality and inclusivity um, in, in, in this continent and also in this country? Um, the issue of lack of infrastructure, you know, you're talking your know, ICT infrastructure, R&D infrastructure, your roads, your dams, and, 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 um, and, and, and all those others. Now, what are the opportunities and why are we so fortunate to be in Africa? Um, is that um, we, Africa is endowed with vast natural resources. How do we ensure that we channel those resources so that we can build this continent? And what will be the role of space science and technology in ensuring that? I've referred to the young population, the challenge again, do we have the quality education that we need? Are we adequately um, um, supplying or ensuring that um, you know, the nutrition and the health in this continent, is, it, it's, it's all provided as part of service de um, delivery to, to those communities and the young people. The, lastly, the, demogra the demographic dividend. So um, we do have this young, brilliant, vibrant population of young people. And um, do we have effective policies and implementation uh, and the implementation plan to ensure that we create this environment where the continent can grow and where we can create more opportunities, where we can have active participants in the um, economic development and improving the quality of life of all um, uh, South Africans and Africans and globally. So I wanted to first give you that context so that um, when we get to the engagement, we will then channel um, the engagement on the basis of what role can then space play in the 21st century. Um, I'll stop there and thank you. Awesome, awesome. And, and I, I, I don't believe that uh, Nomfuneko Majaja is, is with us at the moment. Is she? No? I don't see her. We'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. But now, Dan, um, moving from, from government, we start moving to, to the, the state agencies that are uh, imbued with the powers from government to, to start getting programs together. And of course, Sansa, you, you being one of those agencies, um, would be collaborating with many others. So maybe you want to tell us how Sansa fits into the whole picture, and then we can talk about the, the various sectors, the engineering and, and, and that sort of thing as well. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, Steve. Uh, and thank you for the chief for that wonderful context, which really makes my job much easier. Because Sansa was created by the South African government to provide for an environment that will allow industrial development in space science and technology and related fields, provide for cooperation with other nations that are involved in space, profile the role space in society through the applications development 
derived from data that comes directly from our satellites. So SANSA is the umbrella body that plays a central coordinating role in the space industry. When you talk about this panel, you are looking at South Africa Incorporate, Space Incorporated. So we are the implementing arm and we are set up in such a way that we interface with the satellites that are going up into space. And my colleague, Gladys Magagula, will be very well positioned to deal with that element of our business. We facilitate the development of missions that are developing satellites that respond to our unique challenges, Mr. Mudawu has so, has so ably alluded to. And we also do research in the near Earth space environment. And we run the only space weather forecasting center in the continent of Africa. And Dr. Rendani will talk to those applications and how monitoring those activities will definitely enrich our lives uh, uh, and help our aviation sector as well as other sectors of our economy to function better and prepared for the disruptions that may come from the adverse effect of outer space activities, particularly the sun as our major supplier of energy. Earth observation talks, of course, to the use of satellites fitted with powerful cameras that are imaging our Earth and uh, helping us to monitor, to basically do what we call inventory of what is where water in our dam levels, whether the water's clue of in Cape Town has enough water to provide Capetonians with water after that long spell of drought we have seen. So yes, Sansa, and of course I am the science engagement manager. So I deal with engaging with various segments of society and saying, how does space connect with the chief of a village in Limpopo, Eastern Cape, Northern Cape, Northwest, Mpumalanga. How does it connect away from the where the facilities of Sansa are, but in the African households and the schools that are entry levels into our communities? So various colleagues will add particular uh, uh, aspects to the bigger value chain we play within. Okay, well, now I'm, I'm trying to form a, a picture here. We start off with a government that says, we feel that space is important. It plays an important role in our economy. So we're going to get an agency like Sansa to pull together partners who are going to make these things happen. And then of course, the first port of call is the engineers, the people who are actually building things that we can stick up in the atmosphere uh, or just beyond the atmosphere so that we can start doing things with those particular tools. Um, so maybe um, we want to hear from, from Gladys or, or um, Justin about the engineering aspect of building these satellites and, and what purposes they serve. So we'll, we'll start with Justin. Would you like to go first and then we'll go to Gladys and, and find out. So Justin, you tell us about the engineering aspect. How difficult is it to build these, these um, satellites? How big do they have to be? And then maybe Gladys, you could tell us a little bit more about what are we actually doing with these satellites? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Dan, for that introduction there. Um, <clears throat> so, wow, uh, that's quite a loaded question. Um, look, it all goes down to the user and what the user, well, what, what's the requirement? What is the need? Um, what does... Um, our, our, our government institutions, or what is the research council, or what uh, applications do we want to develop uh, to satisfy a certain need? I mean, the, the NDP, um, our triple challenges, uh, the SDGs, all talk towards needs. What do these need? And space is a big enabler, especially, uh, you know, remote sensing applications. So if we're talking particularly in terms of the uh, a, a, an image, you know, uh, acquiring imagery of the planet, one form of remote sensing, then um, th that's very useful. I mean, most of the satellites up there in space, in any case, about, about, let's say about 60 odd percent, are taking images of the Earth. You know, it's, it's a very uh, useful data set. 
of various resolutions. So the, the bigger, the higher, you know, the, the smaller, the higher the resolution, probably the bigger the satellite. And there's a whole lot of mechanics around that, uh, looking at whatever orbits and, and, and um, what frequencies we want to communicate on, etc. And that Gladys is uh, very well equipped to uh, talk to the details of that. But the, the point is that it looks, we look at what the user needs. We don't build satellites for the sake of building satellites. They are a vehicle, they, they perform a function or a set of functions, and they have a certain uh, uh, integrity, reliability that is required. And the engineering side is just to say, okay, you want, you want this, and we will then translate it into some technical specification, and we'll go back and we'll make sure that we do the best we can to fulfill the needs. You, know, you can't do, all, you can't fulfill all the needs. I mean, there's a lot of them, huh? So you need to kind of strategize and say what kind of missions we're going to roll out, what technologies are required, what don't we have, what do we need to develop, what is the readiness level of certain technologies, um, what is uh, going to be required in infrastructure to be able to develop the satellite that we require. So if we need a thermal vacuum chamber that is of a larger size, then we need to either buy one, build one, you know, fix what we have, build up the infrastructure in the testing facilities to be able to ensure that once the satellite is launched, our taxpayers' money, yours and mine, and the rest of the citizens in the country are expecting that money to be spent wisely. And space is a big, uh, you, know, you can't go up and go fetch the thing if it doesn't work, right? And, and hence it's pretty expensive because unlike certain terrestrial equipment, you can go pick it up, fix it, you know, and send it back into operation. And so from an engineering perspective, it's, it's a rather complex situation because it's, it's the satellite itself is, as I said, just a working vehicle. Uh, but because of the complexity of the environment that we don't completely understand, but we have good models, and the uh, inability to maintain it physically, it takes quite a lot of uh, smart, very intelligent people <laughs> sitting together, figuring out these problems with the ultimate objective to solve a problem, to, to talk to a need that a user has so that we can deliver data consistently, repeatedly of high quality over a certain period of time so that our colleagues in uh, the user community, Earth Observation, Sensor scientists can then continue their work and deliver as per their promise to their customers, the users, and of course to the citizens of our country. We, we as Sensor, we're a national gov government body and agency, and we're here to serve our country, our people. And that's where we get the user requirements from. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so now Gladys, we're gonna go over to you. We'll throw a tough one at you. Uh, first of all, what satellites do we have up there? Are we spying on our neighbors? That's what I want to know. And, and Elon Musk has now just thrown up a whole bunch of satellites all over the place. Are we not worried about space junk and all these extra satellites that keep being launched from different countries? Are we not gonna have too many out there? Is that not gonna interfere with the quality of, of, of the observations we're making? To all the attendees. Wow, what a question. Anyway, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the question that you just, uh, one of the questions, ask too many questions, Steve. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen must just uh, put up, uh, not, not only him, by the way, put up a whole lot of satellites up there. So every time um, I get this question, I then think of, uh, driving on the N1 from Pretoria to Johannesburg. Eventually, probably the space uh, is going to be like that, where it's just traffic. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. space traffic. Um, yes, uh, the thing is, like Justin said earlier, once you put the satellite up there, um, I mean, the first satellite was put in the uh, in late 50s. Once you put the thing up there, with this uh, ever-changing technology, you can't go and take it and uh, remodel it and put it back. So that's th why now we have the need to keep putting things up there. And because technology changes so fast, even the satellite that we launched two years ago might not serve us two years from now. So that's why then we keep putting up uh, uh, 
stuff up there. As to the the satellites that we have, I mean, uh, before I go there, one of the questions that you asked, Justin, is what do we use these satellites for? I, I guess today's uh, session gives one good example because thanks to satellite technology, we are able to be connected from wherever we are today. Like, uh, I mean, with the, especially with these challenges that we've had of late with all this working from home, a lot of us who wouldn't be able to to sit here and still be able to uh, produce some outputs for uh, as per our contracts if it was not for, uh, for satellite technology that uh, made possible for us to be connecting to the internet today. So, and then satellites get put up there for various reasons, uh, then touch to uh, a lot of them. And uh, when you asked how many satellites do we have up there, and are we spying on our neighbors? Did you mean specifically South Africa or in general? Uh, you're on mute, Steve. South Africa, obviously we've sent satellites up to space. How many have we sent up? What, what have they been doing? And is one of those activities from a military point of view? <laughs> Okay, one of the questions that you asked, especially the last one, there are some of the things that are labeled classified. So I'll leave the classified ones because I don't have uh, a, a, the right classification to talk about those. But as for uh, South Africa, the number of satellites that you've sent up to space is one, two, three, four. Yeah, that I can talk about, I think. The first satellite that was sent up to space uh, from, uh, that was built in South Africa, was the sunset that was built by students at satellite, uh, at Sun, uh, Stellenbosch University. And then uh, after that, it was Sumbande Lasat. Sumbande Lasat uh, is when the government decided to resuscitate the space program in South Africa, approached Stellenbosch and said, hey, we want, we had you guys can build stuff that can fly up there. But Stellenbosch is an academic institution, probably a project of that magnitude is too big for them. Then they spun off a company called, at that time it was called Sun Space and Information Systems. Probably you see the link there, Sunset, Sun Space. Yeah, but Stellenbosch University has got this sun thing happening there. So Sun Space then built uh, Subandi Lasat. Um, I was lucky enough that at that time I had just graduated from Stellenbosch. I didn't build Sunset, by the way. I had just graduated from Stellenbosch, but one of the uh, guys who was at the time a lecturer, at, was my lecturer at Stellenbosch University, was now a, a director at Sunspace. And then he gave me a call and said, together with this resuscitation of the space program, the government is uh, doing an internship, aren't you interested? I'm telling you from where I was working, I managed to resign without burning any bridges. Within a week, I was in Cape Town and was there. So, so <laughs> uh, Sumandila Sat uh, was launched in 2009 and Sumandila Sat was a remote sensing satellite. And because at the time, the government was just resuscitating the space program, it was not built with space rated, uh, all space rated uh, um, components. Some of the components were commercial off the shelf, which meant that they'll be vulnerable to all the uh, radiation that happens in space. Uh, Somalia was meant to have a lifetime of about three years. It flew just over half of, of that uh, three years. Uh, of course, giving us very valuable lessons from there. So uh, I was lucky enough to be appointed as the mission control specialist for Sumandi Lasat. And then after Sumandi Lasat, uh, we didn't move as fast as we had hoped for with the successors there to, to be able to implement immediately the lessons we learned from Sumandi But that was not all lost. Uh, the universities came again and then CPUT sent up two CubeSats to, to space. So those are the four beds that are up there. Not all of them are fully functional, by the way. Uh, Sumand Lasat suffered radiation damage as well as sunset. So we are left with the two cubes that are 
doing tremendous work. And where I am currently, I work for the for Sansa, but on the ground station side. As Steve and Dan mentioned, that while uh, the government decided in the early 2000s to resuscitate the space program, South Africa had been involved in space for a number of decades before then. So the ground station that I'm based at was started by NASA in nine, in the late 50s to early 60s. So we've and we've been and probably Dr. Rendani will spoke will speak about the Hermanas uh, uh, site of Sansa, which also was existing way before Sansa uh, was formed. So at the ground station, uh, Dan spoke about all these nice pictures that the satellite to takes. If it was not for ground stations like where I work, the satellite is now in space. How I get, how would you get the information down here? So we use. Um, various antennas uh, depending on the satellite, of course, to communicate with, with us. Just like I can call uh, a Vodacom number and I can call a Celsius number. So with the satellite, with all the, uh, how they are made, the frequencies uh, with my antenna, I can communicate with a satellite that is transmitting on the X band, on the KU band and on and on like that. So. That's basically, we then communicate with the satellite, get now the information back from the satellite so that me and you are able to use it. And over and above that at the ground station, we also help, we do what we call launch supports, where now whichever client of ours uh, um, is launching their spacecraft, and because the Earth is how it is, they won't be able to see the spacecraft from when they launched it up until it reaches its desired spot in orbit. Uh, they won't see, be able to see it all the time. So our ground station where we are, we are nicely positioned to be able to then render a service to some of our clients to once after they launch the, their spacecraft, we are able then to take over and monitor it for, for the specific time when we can see it up until we tell them that, wow, your satellite has separated nicely from the rocket and it's nicely in orbit. And we also uh, used to do a lot of what we call in-orbit testing. And as much as we can't get, get, go and fetch the bed up there to come and fix it, we can fix it from up there. So we use then our ground station as well to be able to communicate with satellites and do in-orbit testing. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so, so now we've got a picture. We've got the government supporting space. We've got the agencies supporting uh, the, the structural building of these satellites. We've heard why we need satellites, but now we should chat to people who are actually observing things from the satellites. And I thought we would go and speak to Dr. Abel Ramoele, and we've also got Dr. Rendani Ngan. Ganeni. I'm getting quite good at this. Um, they're going to talk about the, the application of, of, of um, space weather and earth observation and just give us a bit of a, a background as to why these satellites are even important at all. So who would like to go first? <laughs> uh, Abel is already there. <laughs> you are there. You're there like a bear. You're in like a pin. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, let me... I uh, just thank you, Steve, and also the uh, panelists and also the viewers um, who are all over the world. And then um, I think the, the question you're asking is, is very pertinent. You know, what's the importance then of, of observing the Earth, you know? And, um, you know, I really like when um, uh, Mr. Mudao was giving, you know, a perspective in terms of um, generally what is it that we, we, we can do with, um, with the space uh, science and technology. And then um, also Justin mentioned something that is very pertinent that when you develop this type of um, you know, sensors, especially for the for remote sensing side, Earth observation application, what you're trying to do is to address specific needs. They are, they are tailor made to answer specific questions or, or inform specific decisions. Um, I think uh, today I'll just uh, give you maybe generally uh, in terms of which which are those key thematic areas you know we could use earth observation to, um, to 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 inform decisions because what is really important uh, when you start having all these pictures that people took 
uh, the sensors took all over the world, you know, we are able to discern um, information that can assist, you know, several government uh, departments to take decisions uh, on a number of things. For example, um, I, I, I work with uh, the South African uh, National Parks, you know, we managing about 4 million hectares of area. Uh, imagine if you want to understand the what is happening in all those parks. I mean, the, the best way to do that would be to use remote sensing. That is when you start looking at the issue of uh, the area of biodiversity monitoring. And then uh, within the, that sector of biodiversity monitoring, there are a number of things that you can do using remote sensing. And then most of the uh, cross-cutting, um, you know, um, things that you want to do is to assess what is the state of, um, of, 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 of your biodiversity, it could be vegetation, and then, and then continue to monitor it and also start coming up with um, early warning types of systems that could actually tell you that, you know, in future, this is likely going to happen. And then you can sort of be proactive in terms of your, your management. Um, and then, um, I mean, within some parks, of course, uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, remote sensing with other colleagues and also our partners, collaborators, uh, who, are, who are doing, um, you know, specific uh, 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 monitoring activities. I, like for me, especially, I do more of vegetation, um, you know, condition assessment and then how the current vegetation could support, you know, number of animals and so forth. And I work with quite a number of uh, specialists looking at those things. Another domain that is very important as well, you know, of course, you know, when you, 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 you're designing the needs, as, as Justin was saying, you need to then um, look at whether you're looking at local, national, you know, global, or even continental. That's why he gave examples of things like your, your sustainable development goals and then your, within South Africa, you're looking at the national development plans and then other key enablers uh, or policy that actually we need to really try to inform. And then um, just to give the, that as a perspective, then the other example is within the agriculture. You know, you want to understand the extent of agriculture, um, the, the production, uh, the crop performance, the, 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 the production itself. So how can we sort of monitor that? Can we even focus that? With, with earth observation, you can do all those things. And then within the livestock production sector as well, you, you can actually assess the vegetation and understand whether the vegetation you are, you are having would sustain specific, you know, um, you know um, livestock production activities and how many animals to put, how much production are you focusing, and then all those type of things. You can only take those decisions when you have more information about your, um, you know, your environment and earth observation is key on that. The other one is what uh, Dan was alluded to, uh, looking at issues of water resources management, you know, we can inform planning, and then we can also assess what is available, and then what is the quality of what is available. And then that way, when you start, you know, looking at the allocation, the planning and management is much easier for a department like uh, Water Affairs to, to take decision on the, on the waters. And then when you go to also, you know, other thematic areas like health, you know, now with COVID-19 and so forth, there's a lot of roles of, of uh, earth observation, you know, into trying to assist um, on the response, you know, understanding which areas are more densely populated and how best, you know, can, can we res respond to this sort of pandemic. Then you, there are quite a number of examples I could give. I just wanted to give you the highlights of these ones, which I think informs uh, actually why we spend a lot of money into developing the sensors and then also, um, you know, uh, acquiring that sort of information, storing it that in involves a lot of infrastructure actually in terms of, uh, um, you know, a lot of data set that is coming through. We are in the era of both industrial revolution now. We were saying we want the data. When the data is there, we are able to interrogate it using new technologies to, to to develop that sort of information that is important for, for taking um, yeah, decision. Uh, and then I think these are some of, of the example why we say earth observation is very important. There are a number of examples which I can actually explain as we, we go on in the engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're gonna to go to Dr. Indani. Would you like to 
share a little bit more about space weather and, and some of the other things that maybe uh, Abel didn't touch on? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. So at the Space Weather Center, we are one of the regional center in Africa. And in 2018, the International Civil Aviation Organization has uh, given us the status so that we can be able to provide the space weather information to the aviation industry. So what do you mean by space weather? We are talking about uh, what is happening on the sun and how does it affect the technology in space and also on the earth. So we do near space environment. So which means that distance between the earth and the sun, that one AU, so it's about 150 million kilometers. So we are actually looking at how the sun impacts uh, our various technology. And also this is very important because it affects all different sectors, whether it might be economics, we are talking about uh, energy sector, health sectors, and even our power grid. Because, for example, uh, if you have the extreme space weather uh, storms, it can actually cause something called geomagnetic induced current, which means it causes the transformer to accumulate excessive electricity. And that can actually lead into transformer bend out. So we have an example of the storm that happened in 2003, where one of the South African transformer was damaged due to that storm. The storm was called the Halloween storm. So it's very important that we, we study those and understand and mitigate the effects. The unfortunate thing is we can't control what the sun is doing, unfortunately, but we monitor it in near real time. So we have a space weather center where we have the image from the sun, uh, from the satellite, and also we have different uh, ground-based instrumentation. So we have, uh, for example, lots of antennas in the, into Antarctica, so the Antarctica is very good because it's a, a space window into geospace. So whatever is happening in space, in terms of uh, space weather, we get to see it first into our different station at uh, Antarctica. And then we are able to actually monitor and give information or warning to our client. Uh, the work that I specifically do is in terms of uh, the, the space weather impact in terms of aviation. There we are actually looking at four different areas, which is communication, uh, navigation, and then also the health aspect, which deals with the radiation impact. Uh, I know the perspective is that uh, in uh, mid latitude where we are, we shouldn't be worried about uh, radiation exposure. It's only at uh, high latitude or at the polar region because the direction of the magnetic field is directly perpendicular to the Earth magnetic field. So at, at high latitude, then you get all those particles streaming in, but at uh, mid latitude and the equator, you have the highest shielding. So which means you don't get as much particles, but it is still important that where we are, we should actually understand the radiation environment as to how it impacts our lives and also our technology on the ground or in space. So we are busy with the accreditation accreditation from the ICAO, we will be uh, starting to provide the information to the aviation industry in 2022. So which means uh, will be uh, the when the plane take off from anywhere in the world, they should have information regarding the space weather information, whether the high frequency will be working, or whether they will be affected to what extent whether the GPS will be affected because they use GPS for landing and takeoff and taxi. So you should actually have that information. If it is in terms of radiation impacts, if then you have an extreme storm, then which means you can advise the, the pilot or the airlines that they should reroute instead of grounding the flight. Because then if you have to ground the flight, you have to take into account the cost that you accumulate. So you can imagine if you have to ground all the flights, uh, let's say from Cape Town to London, for example, so who then is be, will be liable to hold all the costs? Is it the airlines? Is it the com airport company? So it has also the economic impact. And space weather does not only uh, it affect the global industry also. 
because imagine if then you have a space order event that affects your GNSS or your GPS. So which means you won't be able to do that uh, bank transaction that depend on the timing and the working of the, the real clock timing of the GPS. Imagine if then you, you made a wrong transaction to the wrong person. So that can be a disaster. And we're so used to, these days we don't ask direction, we don't use maps. We are so reliable on the relying on the GPS on the on your computer on your car. So imagine if you put direction and you know where to be found, but then you just put in those coordinates. But then you have a space weather event that you are not aware of, and then you end up at the wrong lo location. So it's very important that we understand those things and uh, mitigate on them. And also the, the other important factor that I should actually point out is if then you have the impact in terms of power grid, let's say you have a national power grid that is down for over weeks. So it's gonna affect your health to start with. Let's say for water supply, those people who are on machine support and then the people who depend, the medication that has to be in the freezer, even if you say you can run a generator, you can only use it for so long. But then what about in terms of uh, long term? So we need to actually understand those impacts and then uh, holistically how it affects each and everyone or the simple men on the ground. Also, you were talking about the satellites. Uh, those satellites are also affected by uh, the space weather. And also, most importantly, you, for security reason, you know that the military doesn't use satellite comm because it can easily be intercepted. They depend on their high frequency communication which is severely affected by the space weather event. So we need to understand that and mitigate the impact so that uh, we can actually also be safe. And also uh, is a requirement at aviation industry that you have to do, you need to have the two set of communication uh, where HF high frequency communication is one of the, the backup that they use. Uh, uh, as a means of communication. They have, yes, the satellite communication, ADSL, yes, but all those things are still affected by space weather. So we need to understand and then mitigate. So there's a lot that I can talk about uh, uh, in terms of space weather and it's important how everything is connected and interdependent, so yes. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I know I will be coming back to you with a question. Uh, we were all struck down by co coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19 caught us all with our pants down. We weren't expecting it and it shut down the world. If we have solar flares that are debilitating and knock out all our satellites, that means you won't be able to watch your Sieven de Laan uh, when you need to. You won't be able to make that cell phone call or do your internet banking Woo, the scandal. I mean, what, were, what are people going to do? How are they going to mitigate against protecting their satellites? I'm coming back to you on that one. I do want to move over and we've got two or three more sectors I want to touch on. The education sector I want to get to first and then we're going to get to industry and then don't worry, Sir Stuart, we're coming to you. Last but not least. So we're going to go to our teachers we have Bridget and we have, uh, let's see, Pam. And you guys are going to talk to us about an organization by the name of SAGTA or SAGTA. How do you pronounce it? So maybe, uh, Bridget, would you like to go first or Pam, it's up to you. Who's going to go um, first? I'll go first. Okay, Pam, you're throwing in your okay. hat. Pam. So I'm wearing my, yeah. Sorry, Pam. I'm wearing I'm my... Yeah. Oh, I'm going to, ju yes. I just, I'd rather, just to save time, I'm not going to um, use my slide presentation and then just refer to what um, Pam is doing. So can I just quickly interrupt and then just, um, just talk to what SACTA is and the remote sensing val value chain and then I'll keep quiet and then I think it will lead into what Pam is going to showcase. Sorry, Pam, with your permission. <laughs> I know I just thank you, thank you. Um, my my other hat is also uh, for JISA, the GIS Society of Southern Africa, and I wear the education hat. So just to save time, and I think it'll lead into what Pam is going to be presenting. Um, we are educators and uh, geographers 
and I'm also about to hand in my dissertation. And we are in the terms of value chain for what you are doing. We are in our job is to encourage the youth and to actually encourage the youth to go into this all important sec um, sector. And SACTA, which is the South African Geography Teachers Association, Pam is going to be showing you what we've made available for teachers, to, especially during the whole um, pandemic, pandemic. And um, she's going to be showing you something that we quickly fast tracked. And it's thanks to all the imagery that you made available. Thank you to Sansa for making it freely available for education and also aerial imagery through NGI. Pam is going to show you what is available now to everyone. And there are also some lessons which are available under GIS on the JISA website and on the SACTA website. So rather than show my presentation, because I'm just conscious of time, Steve, is mm -hmm. that um, Pam can then just go and talk to the website. And if you just go off onto GIS, then you can see all the YouTube movies that we've made available. We use remote sensing and teach it as part of the grade 10, 11, and 12 curriculum in geography. We love space science. We deal with how it changes, what happens from the sensor as we pick up um, the imagery, and then we adapt it. We use open street maps where a lot of our learners are actually digitizing the data, collect it as vector data, and map it. And using open street maps, um, a lot of our students, um, especially during lockdown, there's this new term which is called asynchronous learning. A year ago, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> so this enables the teachers, when we're trying to catch up, to um, learn, teach on all sorts of platforms, it enables anyone with a cell phone to go and map their communities. So they are given a satellite image or an aerial image, and they're able to digitize all the local water sources, the hospitals, and then um, humanitarian open street map is able to use this and act on that. So this is what we've got a whole lot of prepared lessons that are available on the JISA website, on the SACTA website, and then Pam is going to then show you the next value chain. And I just wanted to quickly cut in there because I don't need to show my presentation now. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. And, and so Pam, over to you. So uh, I've got a few things to just say before I go to the presentation. So Dan, thank you for including geography in this platform. Um, I heard you at the IAB conference earlier this year, and I remember you saying science must engage with society. Well, I believe that geography is the one subject that does engage with society. So the next question I have to say is, Everybody thinks geography is this airy-fairy subject. Geography is a science. It's an agricultural science. It's an atmospheric science. We produce agriculturalists, meteorologists. It's an environmental science. It's an earth science. It's a geospatial science. It's a social science. It's an economic science. So geography wears so many hats. And I really believe that geography should have more emphasis in the school curriculum. And when I look, I've listened to all these wonderful talks and, and discussions on space, the earth and space. You know that nowhere in the geography curriculum from the little Lees to grade 12, is there any space? It's in the science curriculum, but science doesn't want it. We would like it back. And particularly as we are doing so much remote sensing, GIS training at grade 10, 11, and 12. And I would believe the grade eights are ready for that as well. They could do simple things, they all use cell phones. So that, that, it's so exciting to be here, Dan, and thank you very much. And then just to um, comment on Gladys's um, comment about space, space being a junkyard and everything. So we as a school always kept um, space in the geography curriculum because the kids love it. And we would always have a debate. This house believes that space is becoming a junkyard. And my goodness, 
did you have a debate? I mean, from every perspective. So I really think there's so many ways in which we can bring science, space science to the learners um, if we are more proactive. So that's really what I wanted to say first. Now I want to just share what Richard said I should share. So I do want to just look at this slide first. I'll start here. Okay. I just want to start here with some of our initiatives because Bridget said um, I would explain one of them. But as she mentioned, we, we do have an online prep share platform for all teachers. And then with the COVID-19 lockdown, we opened up an open share resources section and gave everybody access. The one I'm going to look at is this map downloader. This is the most amazing thing. And if you've mastered it, you could make a map in about three minutes. We also have a journal, Jogesa. It's a biennial electronic journal, and we encourage educators, academics to write for this, uh, and their papers on the GIS and everything else. We also are co-partner, or we're in collaboration with the Society of South, South African Geographers, um, and we host the SANGO, which is the Southern African National Geography Olympiad. It is the only online Olympiad. There are about one or two other Geography Olympiads that are online in the world. And we're going into our fourth year. And this year, the Royal Geographical Society has come on board with us. We provide webinars, we have academic and field conferences, and we do allocate or award annual visitor uh, visitorships to the international conference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight to the presentation. I'll skip this out. We may come back to it. But just to talk about this particular um, tool that we've developed, um, and we have fast-tracked it, and it's still in its infancy, but it's the most amazingly helpful tool. So it's called Sector Map Downloader, and you go to the Sector website, you can click on the button, there's a video that tells you exactly how to do it. So the first thing you're going to do is it will bring up an open streets um, map, and you'll go to the top right-hand corner, and what you're going to do there is you will type in whatever area you um, want to look for. So I've typed in Underberg. As soon as you do that, the open street map brings a tab down and you select the correct uh, municipal district. So you can actually zoom in, click on that, and then you would go in um, to the map. So in the background, I've got the map. So the first thing you would do on the left-hand side, there is a tab that says layers. And you're on OpenStreetMap. You can get an also photo, which you can produce landscape or portrait, A3 or A4. And then obviously, um, if I want to produce a topographic map, I would then click on that. And it would call up the map. It takes a while to download. And then once you've selected your area, you press this print button here, and a tab comes up. And it enables you to select the format, the scale, exactly. You can pan and um, sort of move the grid around so that you can get the exact um, map that you want to produce. You obviously look at the DPI and select 300 because it needs to be very clear. You're going to save it as a PDF. You click print and this is what you have in front of you. So that's um, I think that's an A4 map. It has a grid. We're still working on the grid here. There's the alphanumeric grid. There's the topographic map. And then the second page has the key. And this is using NGI data, Cartosa, QGIS open source, and there's our map. And so teachers can actually have access to maps at home, in the classroom, um, they cannot ever say they haven't got the resources. And this takes about three to five minutes to produce. Now the author photo looks something like this. I've done one for the same area. Um, 
But obviously we're using NGI, the orthophoto set. Some areas are come up very clearly, some areas are not sort of very good for um, detailed analysis. Um, just to prove that this is a NASA imagery from Landsat and the Earth Explorer. You can see the difference in quality. And this in the Underberg area that we were looking at, I think my photograph is from there. This is what's on the other side. So a lot of that is not as clear as that, but you select it and obviously that's what we look at. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, so it's quite important that we as an organization are probably one of the only teacher organizations that's directly involved with teachers at this level and also with learners, empowering learners, and really we are here to get involved. So please take us seriously. Awesome, thank awesome, you. thank you. Um, just before I go, uh, someone wants you to know, Bridget, what is a, a geo ambassador? Is that someone who goes out and wears the big geography badge? <laughs> Geo -mentor. Or a geo mentor. <laughs> a geo mentor. You are all geo mentors as well. Um, so it's just actually adding to the value chain and making people aware and the benefits of other products that can come out of remote sensing. Um, and just what we want to do is encourage the youth so that they can um, all become. Um, ambassadors for for space and and they love it they, it's a um, we're making geography very sexy and that is why we want to actually have space back and remote spit sensing is very key and integral to what we teach awesome awesome and if I could okay. add to that if you use the train the train or you're training teachers get them to select a grade 10 11 and 12 people to come with and we do the map training together and they learn so quickly, the, the youth. They could be teaching each other and they would know how to use all this material half an hour. Um, what I wanted to show, which is on the sector site, is we enabled all our learners to produce a five kilometer buffer. During lockdown four, people didn't, want, didn't know where the exercise zone was. So they actually, uh, quickly used GIS to do a geoprocessing buffer. They found their, their home and they produced the buffer. And then they went armed with the map in case any person in authority should stop them to say, I am well within my rights. I'm within five kilometers of home. So this was a very a real application. And, and this is why uh, remote sensing and GIS, I think is so important. In fact, we're doing all the four IRs and I think it's quite key. And as Pam, I just want to emphasize that um, geography is a science. I mean, both of us come from a science background and we would like to be taken seriously. So if science don't want to teach it, we do. Well, we'll sort out both of you. I think everyone should be teaching space. <laughs> it's very exciting. So then of course, we're gonna move over to another part of the educational sector. And that is the science centers uh, in South Africa. They play a very important role in uh, science communication and in particular promoting space. So I'm going to go over to Daniel. Daniel Motsapi, would you like to chat uh, on behalf of SARSTEC? What, what would you like to say? Uh, you, uh, you're going to unmute yourself? Otherwise, we, we're going to have to lip read and that's another whole session. No, you're not unmuted yet. Have you clicked on your microphone? Um, I, I just sorted that out. Yes. Um, so we, we are Southern African Association of Science and Technology Centers. And I'd like to talk about who, who we are, the two key drivers, um, who we represent and why we represent them and their existence. Um, the focus will be on the national development plans um, 2030. I think Daniel Matsapola will, will surely talk about the 2063. Um, I normally don't want to talk about it during Youth Month because a lot of people on this platform would be very old by then. Um, but we would talk about why we are in this platform. And then um, I, I'd like to make a, an observation to Pam 
we, we as science people really want space science. Um, we have seen the value and towards the end of the presentation, you'll really understand that it has played a very valuable role in, 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 in the understanding of science. Um, the unfortunate part is that we are in the informal um, science space. So the, the formal science might have a problem with space science, but the informal science wants it in the formal science. So let me talk about what, who we are and how we feature in, in the whole system. Um, yes, I'm here. So the key drivers for, for SASTEC is that we, we want to facilitate creation of technologically based African society. And we want this society to be a very competitive society in the global economy. And also that we, we our biggest wish is to have us um, having a role in improvement of, of life in the South of, of Southern African nations. Um, and this, this is simply to do it by scientific knowledge. And what better way of improving scientific knowledge than to have space science. But let me talk about um, the, our members who are science engagement centers. And um, Steve would understand why I use STEMI engagement centers instead of simply saying science centers. Um, and Pam, I would like to bring you in here because now if, if you are engaging people scientifically, um, and yes, I still do believe that geography is a science that is never discussed. Um, and is never given the platform that it deserves. But the, these centers, um, we have over 35 of them, and we also have members who are in formal education. The role is we use effective methods to teach science, technology, mathematics, and engineering. And most importantly, now we are moving towards innovation. Um, these centers are designed to increase skills and understanding of um, STEMI. And the idea is to demystify the world of science and technology. And yes, this again brings again the idea of making sure that space becomes the key driver in, in these discussions. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for space, we wouldn't have um, space science. It, we wouldn't have this discussion um, or we wouldn't have the platform to have these discussions. And these centers, they stimulate curiosity. Um, they develop inquiring minds and expose children and adults to positive new experiences. How do they do this? Um, it's either in-house or with going to a specific center. A lot of our um, members have taken their audiences from where they are based to even Sansa uh, or places where space is explored. Now, how do, how do we link with the global, uh, the continental and the national development agenda? And like I said, I was going to only speak, speak about um, the 2030 agenda. Uh, Africa has its own 2030 agenda. Um, interestingly, our, the African 2030 agenda speaks to the 2030 agenda of the sustainable development um, of the United Nations. So it speaks to the global. And one of the things that it speaks about is partnerships. And regarding that, it says that we realize that our ambitions across the full extent of the agenda, the lives of all will be profoundly improved and our world will be transformed for the better. So meaning we, the idea is to have partnerships. And if we as, as, a, as, a, as a society, we partner with government, we partner with agencies like um, the space agency and not excluding the, the, the international um, counterparts, um, our NASA's, we need to really have those partnerships and these partnerships can really benefit us. Um, and the South African NDP, it says that it aims to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by, by 2030. Um, we, we are just 10 years to go and hopefully we can realize that. But how do we realize that? We can realize that um, by drawing on the energies of, of our people. And with our people in this case, we, we really need to talk to the people who are going to use 
space science, not only now, but in the future. And so those people are really young people at the moment. And science centers really want to tap into that space where we have our young people um, being part of these discussions. Now, how does this fit in all of them? Um, they fit in such that if you look at what we do as science centers, we want to promote um, science education. But science education is not only limited to what we've already know or we've, we've been taught as um, at this present moment, we go become an engineer or we become um, a science teacher or just those limited ones. We, we expose our learners or our visitors, including adults that visit our centers to really a, a, a bigger picture, including space um, careers. Um, unfortunately, a few years ago, funding for a discussion into space, because a whole lot of science centers used to include space discussions in their annual agenda. They, they used to be, and the, the World Space Week has not ended. So the World Space Week still exists, and a lot of our members are still continuing. Unfortunately, there was funding that was um, cut for the World Space Week, but we still believe that as, as members of society, as science centers and science and technology centers, we need to have discussions into driving our learners into thinking um, uh, like, like future, future space um, engineers. The South African NDP says that South Africa needs to sharpen its innovative edge and continue contributing to global scientific and technological advancement. I don't know if you see that image. Um, that image is taken in one of the science centers. It's an image of a exhibit exhibiting a black hole. Um, these discussions we are having with with our learners and the visitors at, in in our in our science centers, and these are the discussions that we want them to take from the science center into their homes and um, probably into their future careers. Now, what would happen if we didn't have space um, discussions? Look at one of the exhibits that we have. Um, the exhibits, the exhibit on your left hand side um it's it's my right hand my left hand side it says without space science um we would not be able to communicate properly um but the exhibit with space science shows that learners are engaging um in development um these learners were saying there and this was done just before the lockdown was instituted, that they were going to develop something for the ESCOM Expo um, in, in terms of space. And we're hoping that we can have these discussions to ensure that the value of space science is increased and its impact is seen. And with science centers, this is our role. We want it to be seen and we want it back in, in the curriculum to be properly taught and to have these learners considering space careers, space science careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> don't worry. We, we've got two, two or three more speakers to go, but we're going to try and squeeze it in the last 15 minutes. Um, I want to move to industry because industry is where a lot of the money lies. Some of these people are actually making money out of the space. Some of them are using our graduate students to make money. And, and I want to maybe hear from Liako, if you want to just, uh, Liako Takalani, if you want to just say a few things about industry and how it all fits together. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, talk about making money. I wish uh, we had that pot of gold. <laughs> but I would like just to take us through some of the insights. I think most of the speakers have already spoken about uh, most of the pertinent issues. And I'm really excited as we are talking about uh, Youth Month. Um, we know that uh, June is a very important month in South Africa especially the 16th of June. So I speak to the audience today as the CEO of uh, Luvon Engineering under the business unit One Aerospace. So we're a new space company uh, that is just less than five years old, but we will share with you what we've been doing in the space sector and what role industry can play. So 
I'm really excited when I see how Africa is going to progress. This is just something a friend of mine sent to me last year. It's the population pyramid uh, across the globe. So you will see that Africa has the highest uh, level of young people in the continent. So for example, the total youth population in Africa constitutes about 37.6% of the entire 1.3 billion. This is the highest in the world, even comparatively to China as well as India. So it means, as uh, Mr. Mudao has mentioned, we really have an opportunity as a country. And I know we touched briefly on the sustainable development goals. And I think here what's key to note in terms of space science is that we touch all these elements in the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, particularly one that is really um, related to bending the arc of poverty is hunger in the world, as well as climate action. I think our colleagues already touched on space weather, how it impacts all of us. And Daniel spoke about partnerships. And we, as private industry, we've seen the value of partnerships and how we need to work together. So where do we fit in, in terms of the space industry? So if you imagine the spheres of space, more like um, an onion that you're trying to peel, we participate mostly in the infrastructure, which is the orange section that you see there. So, for example, we provide ground infrastructure that enables us to communicate with the satellites and we play a role in both uh, Earth observations, uh, satellite communication, navigation. So you can see there's a plethora of applications that are spun out from the in infrastructure that's there. And South Africa has done extensive work in investing in infrastructure as well as some of the projects I will share with you in a moment. So how do we solve the number one problem that we have across the globe, uh, especially as it pertains to Africa, related to eradicating extreme poverty and hunger? And I think we spoke extensively about Earth observation. In, there is a working group called the AfriGeo, which looks at policy and technology advancement. And I really feel that technology advancement requires what we can term the African intellectual economy, because our struggle for young people these days is really how do we participate in intellectual economy. And we continuously need innovation in space science to beneficiate our own space capability. Just to show you some examples, um, Glady spoke about Sumbandira. There's a picture there just for the audience to get a sense what are we talking about when we say these satellites. So we provide infrastructure that talks back to these satellites in space. And uh, as engineers, we have to ensure that we mitigate risks. As Gladys has said, once you put the satellites in space, uh, really you cannot go back to try and retrofit or fix things. So you have to work in a high risk environment. Just some things uh, related to South Africa. Uh, ZA Cube 2 is one of the satellites that Gladys was talking about. This is a picture from the actual launch, uh, which was done in Soyuz, where uh, ZA Cube 2 was inside this rocket for launch. And our role here was to ensure that once uh, the satellite was launched and released into space, South Africa could talk to that satellite. And our role was to make sure the ground infrastructure is working, the communications, as well as ability to know where is the satellite in space. So when we speak of African space leaders or SA Inc, uh, last year sometime in October, we were in Washington exhibiting at the International Astronautical uh, Congress in Washington. And we took our strength with as South Africa, there were many other industry players that were there, Gladys was there, as well as other industries. So the space industry is really mushrooming. And most importantly as well is that the space industry needs women. Uh, there in the picture, the first picture you see there where it says African space leaders, uh, it was myself as well as the director for space engineering at SANSA and also May uh, Jamieson, who was the first black astronaut 
to land in space in the 90s. So we really need young people, especially women, to come and really join this industry. There are so many opportunities in terms of career development uh, related to information systems, uh, data processing, system engineering, etc. So as we speak today, things are happening even during COVID lockdown, the satellites that are being launched. So this picture here is from yesterday. China launched a new Earth observation satellite just yesterday, less than 24 hours, which will be used for city planning, uh, disaster prevention, as well as, you know, assist in crop yield estimation, etc. So space science is really part and parcel of our daily lives. It's, it has just become so ubiquitous that we don't see it. Um, lastly, I wish to say that uh, from Luvone, what we think the youth of today can do is that they can take a strong interest in mathematics and science and sacrifice. If you want good things in life, you have to sacrifice and sacrifice in loving your country and caring about your people. So that is uh, what we could share with the youth of today. And uh, we're really excited that young people have this opportunity really to be part of the space industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and definitely one person that I, I was saving for the end, um, Johnny, you, you are going to be the very end, but one person I was saving towards the end is someone who we, we know him as Stuart, but he's actually called Sir Stuart. And it's not because his parents named him Sir Stuart. He actually earned the, the three letters before his name. And the reason he earned that is because he is a, what we call a habitual inventor. He can't stop inventing things. He just, he can't help it. So, so Stuart is, is an incredible uh, innovator in, in the educational space. And I'd love to hear his take on, on what we've been discussing and what would you like to share with everyone as well? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the invitation to participate in this all important discussion. Uh, I've been listening to all the speakers and I am blown away and how I wish that uh, back during my school days uh, we had access to such uh, amazing information and I think our viewers at home and the many young people as we are celebrating the youth month are learning as much as possible with uh, everything there is to know about space sciences and astronomy and I think I have a very short and cool story uh, that becomes very relevant and uh, intertwined to all the things that all the great speakers have said. My story uh, with space sciences uh, dates back to the year 2002 when Mr. Mark Richard Shuttleworth uh, went to space. Uh, I can't forget the day because it was my grandmother's birthday in April the 27th and when he was out there in space and making a call to a uh, video call to President Thabo Mbeki, I just could not believe it. I could not believe it. And I said, I want to be there. I want to also call a South African president one day and say, hi, this is Sir Stuart from space. But my, 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 my interest was later entrenched in 2003 when uh, a friend of mine bought me a book uh, titled Losing My Virginity by uh, the incredible Sir Richard Branson. And somewhere in, the, in his autobiography, he mentioned his vision to take people into space as tourists. And I just could not get that off my mind. And I decided to write him and share what I think he should do. And I, I wrote to him and I said, uh, you need to design the space shuttle in this way, they must have ABC. And I, well, I did not have access to email or heard about email at that point in time. Um, and our school, I was attending a township school, did not have access to internet. So I decided to send the letter via a, a, an unpopular platform. I was a fan of the Westlife music group, and I knew that they were recording at Vision Music 
and he still owned Vision Music back then. And I sent the letter to them and I said, please pass this letter to Vision Galactic. And I never got any response. That's 2003. And up until the year 2012, in June, I got the response. And, <laughs> and they, um, the, 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 the person on the other end of the call said, we, 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 we checked out your letter and we found it very interesting and we've incorporated some of your suggestions. And we are going to offer you a complimentary receipt on the maiden flight to, 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 to space. And I, it, was a, it was a dream come true. It was an, an unbelievable experience. And I immediately said, this is a very interesting story about perseverance. And fortunate for me, I never stopped working in the sciences, engineering, and technology field. Uh, I attended Science Fest Africa from the year 2006 till to date. Uh, I've been a speaker at Science Fest Africa at one point. And platforms like Science Fest Africa helped me to harness my interest in the space sciences. And uh, my company uh, has recently acquired a, a very piece, uh, a piece, a large piece of land in Clarksdorp where I come from. We are currently turning ten turning the place into a local uh, space uh, agency, uh, a private space agency. We are, we are not competing with Sansa, but we are just doing our own uh, private uh, space uh, activities there. And uh, we are working on what we call an African space vehicle. Uh, we believe that Africa has got a huge role to play in the, in the space sciences. And we, we have found uh, also an unexpected way to actually take people to space. So we are working on a cheaper fuel, uh, uh, cheaper fuel using a new element that we have discovered as, a, as an institute. And also we are going to try it on this, on this model, African space vehicle, which we want to take people uh, to space with in the future. But what I want to say is that um, Sansa and all the, Cyfest Africa included, and all, all the important role players in the South African space industry, must continue to inspire young people to excel in science, engineering, and technology and mathematics. And it goes without saying that uh, these subjects are not popular even today, but uh, young people must be inspired to have uh, an immense interest in these learning areas. We, we are all here on this platform because we, 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 we loved science and math so much. And this platform has allowed us to to achieve a lot in the, in the science, in the, in, in the space industry. And I think uh, Sansa has got a, a very big role to play in ensuring that young people and old people of all sorts can begin to appreciate space. And uh, when I get to space, uh, there's so many things I want to do, but unfortunately, I'll only be there for 104 hours. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I want to do is, uh, is, is, is conduct a, a protein-based experiment just to satisfy my curiosity. I can't disclose um, the experiment in depth. But the fact that a human being will be in space and uh, performing an experiment in space for the advancement of, uh, of health sciences uh, or humanity in general is a very uh, interesting uh, thing to talk about is a very interesting human achievement, or rather it will become an interesting human achievement. And it is one way we can use to show young people that you can't just dream of becoming an engineer, a doctor, a priest, an educator, but there is actually other awesome, interesting careers that you can actually develop into. And I think um, my participation and everyone's participation in this industry will actually help to improve the performance of science and mathematics academically in the country. Young people lack role models in the, in the science and technology sphere. We do not have role models and we, we do not have not even a single young person that we can quote and use as a model in the space sciences, which I believe that it is a very critical uh, learning area or industry for, for, for humanity. You know, as other speakers have given various examples uh, where they are, with regards to their work, where they are involved in space sciences. So I think um, 
we all have a big role to play and we need role models that we can use to entice the science and maths uh, interest amongst young people. So um, I do not want to speak about technical aspects of space sciences. Uh, you all have touched some interesting facts on space sciences, but I would rather just speak about, uh, ask everyone to say, please let us join hands. Let us uh, maybe take the, uh, the advantage that it is the youth month. Let us come together. Let us find ways to interest young people in the importance of space sciences. There is no way anyone in the world who could have survived the COVID-19 pandemic and each lockdowns across. We have multiple We are able to connect and communicate with each other. Information is being sent. Important data has been transmitted at incredible speeds across the medical sciences industry, which is helping to address uh, COVID-19 issues. Therefore, and comparatively speaking, we, we, we must not underestimate the importance of education where science, engineering, and technology is concerned. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Stuart. And, and, and Stuart has kindly volunteered without even knowing that uh, we're going to be doing a Zoom chat while he is in space, and we're going to connect with him and schools live in South Africa so we can ask him questions about what it's like in space while he is floating in space. Isn't that so? <laughs> well, he doesn't know it yet, but we're going to be chatting about that. And I mean, there was one person that I didn't give a chance to speak. I know we are very, very short on time. Um, I just want to ask Johnny Rizos for a comment. Johnny has been coming to SciFest for I don't know how many years, ever since I've been going to SciFest for the past, what, 10, 15 years, whatever it is. And, and you are there representing SANSA in full force. You go out and you go to do all the outreach classes. You are putting on all these passionate things. What message would you like to give the youth? I mean, this is probably your speciality, but what message would you give the youth about space sciences today? Uh, I'd say to the young learners of today is to keep working towards their dream, what, no matter what it is. I know there are a lot of young boys and girls who dream of becoming astronauts. Actually, today I received an email from a colleague to, for a request of a, a young uh, African boy that wants to become an astronaut. And uh, knowing that South Africa doesn't have a astronaut program yet, uh, I've sent him a whole list of uh, links to him to actually read up and follow videos of him becoming an astronaut. And I'd like him to come out to our facilities one day to actually see the process of uh, the space industry. So I'd say follow your dream, uh, no matter from where you are. I'm looking at some of my colleagues uh, that we've been speaking to, they followed their dreams. Um, I've been to Bochum with Dan, where he grew up in. Um, that was a real eye-opener for me. I'm talking about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, that's where I saw the real need for inspiring the young kids in the really deep rural areas. Um, Steve, I've dealt with you, with you at SciFest. I've been going to SciFest since 2005. It's what, 15 years. Um, inspiring the young kids and seeing the sparkle in their eyes uh, when you talk about different um, opportunities out there that they've never heard of special specialized fields the sparkle in their eyes is just unphenomenal and it brings me joy to see this sparkle i've actually had two or three kids in the past 20 odd years that i've been doing outreach that have actually uh, followed their dream. One of the drop shadows that I've had um, is actually working for Esri in Australia, um, which uh, was quite a, uh, made my heart happy seeing that one person. Also other colleagues that I've uh, drop shadowed that are in the science advancement area and they're inspiring other kids. Uh, to me, that uh, out of the thousands of kids that I've inspired, Although I've only reached out to three that I'm seeing them 
uh, following their dream is just phenomenal for me. Awesome, awesome. And on that positive note, I know that Libuhwani, you wanted to ask questions. And Christo, quick, thank you so much for questions. We've run out of time. I told you this is what happened when we have a very large panel. But if you do have questions, I've got your questions, Christo and Libuhwani. And uh, anyone else, please type it in on the Facebook chat. I will make sure that I address the questions to the speakers and I will get them to send responses to you because it's very important that questions do not go unanswered. And on that note, I would like to thank our esteemed panelists who have joined us from all over South Africa. We've had a wonderful time chatting and learning more about the space industry and what South Africa's got to offer. And we encourage all the youth, just go out there, work hard, get involved. Because let me tell you, with SKA, with the establishment of, of all the projects that SANS is involved with, Space is happening in a big way in South Africa, and you need to jump on that bus right now. Don't be left behind. And on that note, I'm going to bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone.